That's when the electric car died, 1999. 1999, General Motors already had some built. Go get who killed the electric car. Take a look at all the vehicles that they already had built. And the people are over there crying and lamenting because they didn't bring those cars out. <laughs> well, guess what? The reason why they didn't bring them out, I killed the electric car. Thank you. That's who killed the electric car. You see that right there? That is the most efficient electric motor that's ever been built in the history of the world. It's our electric motor. It's a permanent magnet motor. Guess what it runs on? Magnets. How many people know that because some dummy in some university hasn't figured out how to do it, that doesn't mean I haven't? <laughs> well, no one's ever done that before. Well, hallelujah, no one flew before the Wright brothers either. Anyway, we took that motor on tour in 1999, the same year they were coming out with the electric car. And guess what happened when we took that motor on tour in 1999? We proved on a stage, 28,000 mile tour, 47 out of 47 successful shows, we were putting one unit of electricity into that motor, permanent magnet motor, we put one unit of electricity in, we got five units of mechanical energy out oh, at every single show. It's not perpetual motion. If electricity was the only power source, bingo, it's a perpetual motion machine. But if the magnets are a second power source, it is not a perpetual motion machine. It is combining magnetic energy with electricity, and it is producing power like any other motor does. A perpetual motion machine is motion without an energy source. That's what a perpetual motion machine is. If you've got an energy source, magnets, and you figured out how to use it and exploit it as an energy source, then you just got more energy going in than you got coming out, and it's a normal motor. And it's got its inefficiencies just like any other motor does. But how many people know that magnetic energy is free? It's free, my friends, it's free. You don't have to charge, you don't have to go to Exxon to get it. You don't have to go to BP to get it. So we literally proved that 47 out of 47 locations, five of them we did on college campuses and none of the college, colleges were interested. Thousands and tens of thousands of people came to those shows and measured it because I let any scientist come up on stage and measure the input and the output over a single wire. Kind of hard to deceive anybody with that. Every one of them that measured it successfully measured exactly what my claim is. It's one of the most important discoveries that has happened in this century and you don't know anything at all about it because that's how serious they are about suppressing and holding back the technologies that would advance humanity. Well, I just want you to understand, they're more afraid of me than I am afraid of them. Because we can bring those technologies out, we can bring those technologies out, we can bring those technologies out, and we have seven ways, eight ways to make free electricity and free energy. So we are picking on engine modifications. There are 200 million cars in America alone. They've already made them. That's the beauty of it. They've already made them. <laughs> they can't recall them. <laughs> we got a technology that can convert every one of them to get anywhere from 50% to as high as 300% using this. Then the technology right behind this, people will be buying three gallons of gas a week. You see how this is working? You're right at the very beginning of that. You're at the very beginning of it. And we have crazier things. I've got the tornado engine, for instance, where we actually create a, a tornado inside of an engine. Is there any power in a tornado? I'll show these things to you at noon at your lunch break. You want to sit back down, I'll just, I'll just show these things to you at noon. So you can see some of this really, really, really interesting stuff. 
we have already got, that's a 50 horsepower electric motor. Anybody here know how big a 50 horsepower electric motor normally is? It'd be like this and you have to have a crane to lift it. Be big thing like this. That right there is a 50 horsepower. I pick it up with my hands like this. But of course what people don't realize is that uh, <clears throat> there's a reason why I drink from this cup. Huh? That motor is here? No. And I'm not going to show you that, but I am going to show you at noon. I'm going to show you one three times the size of that one. It's 150 horsepower. It's ready to set down in your vehicle right now. Hook right up to your drivetrain. That's where we were heading in 1999 when they killed the electric car. Whoops! <laughs> if they would have put the electric car out, they would have set me up like, oh man! <laughs> Be still my heart, because we would have just modified all those electric cars. And that one running on permanent magnets will run on two deep cell marine batteries as long as the batteries last. And then you throw them away and buy some more, and you never stop at a gas station again, ever. So now let's come back to this guy, because this is the subject of our four days together. This is the subject now. But make no mistake about it, March the 5th in Washington, D.C., when this makes its maiden voyage, all of you are going to get a retraining program, and then you'll be bringing back all the mechanics that you taught for a retraining program, and then all the vehicles that we modified to this, and I want to do 100,000 of them before March the 5th. I've done hundreds of them already, but I want to do 100,000 before March the 5th. Why? Because on March the 5th, when we announce this, the next day we want to convert and start converting 100,000 cars to the technology. Where? In Missouri, in Kansas, in New York, in Pennsylvania, in Florida. We want to do it all over the country. At the same time, do you see how important infrastructure is? You're the infrastructure. You go back home and you teach people how to do this. This is enough. This is enough. They'll get excited. They'll get excited about this, 50% to 100%. Doesn't that excite you? 50% if we actually can increase the fuel economy by 100%, isn't that exciting? It's just little stuff, but it's the beginning. So we're going to set this out. Now, we got an ad campaign that's hitting the first week in November. You're close to it. So we're set to hit this massive ad campaign nationwide on the first week of November. And we're just going to keep recapitulating those ads. They're just going in and in and in and in. And every time we sell one of these guys, we have a contribution from each sale going to perpetuating the advertising. By the time we get to March the 5th, <laughs> there'll be very few people in the world in the United States who haven't seen the PICC already when we introduce it, because it's advertising. The pre-ignition catalytic converter, get 100 miles a gallon in your vehicle, that technology uh, uh, is, is, exists now. Go watch the videotapes and take a look at it. And by the way, if you want to get a bid on this, and they go for a bid on this, and what is the first thing we do? The hydro assist fuel cells, the beginning of the PICC. It's step A, and then we do step B. We have 2,000 dealers in place across America right now. We're in every state of the United States of America, and we're on every continent of the world, LER. Every continent of the world. See, we're very deliberately going to make what we're going to make happen, going to make it happen. Now, let's take a look now at water, water gas. H-H-O, water gas. Uh, if I take this machine over here, it makes water gas. We sell these for cutting, welding, and brazing shops. Anybody here do any cutting or brazing? We sell these for cutting and brazing shops all across America. You can weld with it, but no better than you can with any other bottle of gas. Mig and TIG is better for welding. But when we turn this on, that machine, when we flip the button, it is turning water one liter of water 
becomes 2,000 liters of gas. Water expands at a ratio of 2,000 to 1. 1,866 to be exact. That's exactly right. So I say 2,000 to 1 because close enough for horseshoes. We are playing horseshoes, right? If we were doing it scientifically, though, we would go right down to that 66. Now, so it expands like one liter of water becomes 1,866 liters of, of, of water gas. Uh, now, water gas is unlike any other gas in the world. It does everything all the other gases do. So it does everything all the other gases do, but it does some things the other gases don't do. But we don't talk about that. Usually when we sell these machines to, to companies, we just say, it'll do as good as your acetylene will. Come on. Yeah, do as good as your acetylene. It'll do as good as your map gas or your LPG. And you can use the same equipment you got for whatever you're doing now. Map gas, LPG, whatever you got, same equipment. Now, when I open this up, I get a stream of gas out. I light it. When I light that, I now can take my hand and put my hand through the flame. Put my hand right through the flame. No problem. Now, the flame obviously isn't very hot. If I take a piece of aluminum and put a piece of aluminum up to it, it immediately is going to be 900 degrees Fahrenheit. You know why? Because the melting point of aluminum is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And I can actually uh, put a flame on aluminum, and if it's a big enough chunk, water will drip off because aluminum at 900 is not hot enough to vaporize the water. So the water is just going to kind of fall off of there. So I'm going to do that for you so you can see that. What is the exhaust when you use water gas? Water. water. Yeah, that's it. Now, by the way, how is it water? Well, it goes from water liquid to water gas, hit it with a spark, goes back to water liquid again. In other words, you don't even lose the water. You get the water back into the environment. All you're doing is capitalizing on the phase change. Changing state from one state to another state, the energy in that phase change is the energy you're using. It's amazing, you don't even lose the fuel. Now, if I take a piece of copper and put a piece of copper up to this flame, it will immediately become 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Why? Because the melting point of copper is 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. If I take the copper away and I put a fire brick up here, a fire brick, it will immediately become 5,000 degrees because the melting point of fire brick is 5,000 and I can burn a hole right through the middle of a fire brick. Now, by the way, if you tell a cutter that you saw somebody that has burned a hole through the middle of a fire brick, he's going to tell you you're crazy as a hooty owl. You know why? Because it's impossible. You cannot burn a hole through the middle of a fire brick. That's impossible. He can't do it. You know why? Because this is 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire has to get so hot it blows the brick up. Normally that would blow the brick up. Why doesn't it blow the brick up now? Because it is so concentrated. It's focused in that location. You can do this with a laser as well. So you can do it with water gas or you can do it with a laser. Is water gas a unique gas? Oh yeah, water gas is a very unique gas because it automatically changes its temperature to the melting point of any material it touches. Do you think there's any gas in the world that automatically changes its temperature to the melting point of the material that it touches besides this? Do you know of one? No, if acetylene's 3,000, it's 3,000. You can put some oxygen with it and make it a little hotter. That's why you use oxygen. With this guy right here, bingo, it's that temperature right now. Now, I am going to take with my hand, I am going to hold a piece of copper in my hand, like this. I'm going to take the flame from this coming out. I'm going to put my hand through the flame. Can't be very hot if I'm putting my hand through the flame. Then I'm going to put it up to the copper, and I'm going to cut this piece of copper 
while I'm holding it in my bare fingers. Any cutter here, would you hold this in your bare fingers while you cut that? Tell a cutter you watch the guy hold a piece of copper in his head and cut it five times. He's going to tell you, you are crazier than a hootie owl. But I'm going to hold it in my fingers and I'm going to cut it five times. Now, by the way, <clears throat> just as a little hint, <clears throat> I am Superman. I really am. <laughs> Now, I will hold it in my bare hands as long as the flame is on it, but the second the flame comes off of it, you're going to see me drop that real fast. Why? Because as long as the flame is on it, it will not transfer the heat, but when the flame comes off of it, it immediately will transfer the heat, and I don't want my hand anywhere near that. So I cut it in a little pattern so I tell myself when to drop it. <laughs> and then when I pull this off, you'll see me drop it real fast. Now, another thing that I'm going to do with this to prove to you, now, by the way, how many people know the gas made here is the exact same identical gas I'm using here? Same gas. Does it have a That's what we're going to be injecting into your engine. Now, so if I take this flame right here, coming out of here, I'm going to hold a piece of tungsten up to the flame. How many people know that tungsten is really tough stuff? And what do we put it in? We put it in light bulbs. Why? Because we can't melt it. So we'll get the flame, we'll get the high temperature, we'll get the lumens of light without melting the tungsten. That's the whole idea here. Now, I'm going to put it in this flame, and even though I can't melt it, I'm going to sublimate it. What is sublimate? It's a step past melting. Sublimate is where you turn a solid into a gas. Yeah, vaporize it. So you turn it into a gas right now. Now, what temperature do you sublimate tungsten at? Does anybody know? 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're talking centigrade. 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You got to say centigrade here. I mean Fahrenheit with these guys. Okay, sorry, oh, they are. <laughs> You're a centigrade guy. All right. Now, so 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. How many people know that that's the temperature of the surface of the sun? So this is going to get to be the temperature of the surface of the sun the second I put it in this flame. Hello? The flame I just put my hand through I'm going to put my hand through it. Then this is going to be the temperature of the sun. A second later, I'm not going to put my hand through it then. And I'm going to be holding the other end of this piece of metal while this temperature out here is the temperature of the surface of the sun. And this is made to transfer heat. I'm going to hold the bottom with my bare fingers. Do you believe yet? I'm the guy. That's it, brother. And I'm going to hold it here, and just to impress you, I'm going to count to 10 while I'm holding it. And then when I count to 10, I'm going to take this flame off. Now, the second I take this flame off, my fingers are going to be nowhere near this piece of metal. I'm going to be dropping that real fast, okay, right into that pan. So I'm going to do these things for you. Why? Because I want to prove to you what the dynamic of water gas is. Water gas, my friends, has five times the potential energy of gasoline. Five times. Now, if I'm going to take water gas from here, you see this makes the gas? I'm going to take this and I'm going to set it in where? Right into your air intake. So if I'm feeding this water gas into your air intake, what's going to happen? It's going to blend with your gasoline. It's going to have five times the potential energy of gasoline. So guess what? Isn't that going to enrich your gas? If I'm putting something in that has five times the potential energy, am I not enriching your gas? And if I'm enriching your gas, can't I lean it out a little bit? Why not? Oh, that's exactly right. So you see, that's the benefit of the water gas. Now, 
Also, we have other things in there to treat your gas. Because if we can make your gas itself more combustible, we're going to vaporize your gas. We're going to ionize your gas. So your gasoline itself is going to be vaporized, it's going to be ionized, and it's also going to have a covalizer in it. I'm not going to teach you all that because Michael the genius is going to teach you all of that. And believe me, you guys are going to get a real education over the next two days from Michael because he's worth listening to. Now, so what's happening then is you're going to break down the covalent bonds of those long chain molecules that they're sending you. And you know why? Because they don't want to burn them. That complex fuel mixture, let me tell you something, it's designed not to burn. It's designed to burn, but it's not designed not to fully burn. We're going to break them covalent bonds down and just change that a little bit. So we break the covalent bonds down, we ionize and vaporize the fuel, and then we add it to super rich, uh, a richener, the water gas, and that's where the dynamic of what we're doing comes in. But the most important part is not what I just said. The most important part is we also are going to, de de we are going to get past the gatekeeper. How many people know the computer on your car is a gatekeeper? Yes, it is. It's a gatekeeper. It is the gatekeeper that has been designed by its daddy to make sure nobody gets great, greater fuel economy than they want them to have. Well, you're actually going to meet the man today who actually developed the optimizer, our mini computer system in concert with a couple of other people, like an electronics whiz, they, Mike and, and them, have worked together. It's mainly Mike's expertise in, in emissions control systems, et cetera, have worked together to make a program where we actually have a computer. We do not disrupt their system. We do not tamper with their system at all. Their system stays exactly the way their system was manufactured by the manufacturer. We merely go in and teach their computer to run our system. Fool them a little bit. Hello. <laughs> we teach their computer to do our job. That's the genius of this that you're going to learn about today. That's what, we, that's what you're doing. So if you cannot get past the gatekeeper, it doesn't matter how wonderful your technology is because the computer's going to learn it. It's going to go into a default system, and that's it. You're not going to get the savings. So it's wonderful to have a way to get the savings, but if you cannot defeat the gatekeeper, you ain't going to keep them. And I want you to know that I think we're the only people that have done that. So you guys are going to learn a lot from this man over the next two days. And then we're going to learn a lot from you over the next two days after that because you're going to go apply the technologies that we learn. We're going to have some vehicles. We're going to modify some vehicles. And you're going to not only get it in theory, but you're also going to get it in practice. And you're going to see it happen firsthand because seeing is believing. Now, I want to show you what this gas can do. So, Mike, uh, so uh, Ricky, we might as well just turn this thing on and let's get going with it. Now, we're also going to run that engine over there on nothing but water gas. So, we'll run it on pure water gas, no gasoline whatsoever. This right here is an assist, it's a hydro assist fuel cell. We're assisting the normal gasoline system. That one right there would run the whole system on it. Requires more gas to do that, so a smaller amount of gas, we found that if we just energize the fuel that you've already got, that's pretty good. And it's practical because you already got the battery and you already got the electrical system and you don't have to modify much. Now he's going to fill a water balloon with this, so we're going to have a water balloon. You're going to be so popular back in Holland, brother. You are. You already am. Oh, well, there you go. Well, then I'm going to be so popular back in Holland. <laughs> Super. All right, now we just.
tie it off. This, by the way, is a water balloon. That's a water balloon. Now, if I had any other kind of gas, if I had acetylene, it would be heavier than air, right? So it would fall to the ground. But this one has got hydrogen and oxygen, and it goes to the ceiling. Now, over here, I've got my torch. Now, don't hold your torch like this at home. You can't do that. But this is room temperature, so I don't have a problem with that. Don't put your hand through that flame. Not a smart idea. But I can do that. You know who I am. Now, I'm going to take aluminum, and it's not going to be so hot that it immediately vaporizes the water, and so you see the water dripping off of it. Just water. <clears throat> We're going to take this piece of copper, do something nobody here has ever done before, and we're going to cut it. We'll cut a pattern in it. As long as that's on it, I'm okay, but when it's off of it, I got to get rid of it real quick. See, it automatically became 1,800 degrees. Now, this is going to make it automatically become the temperature of the surface of the sun, 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to hold this in that flame, and you're going to see gas coming off of it like a yellowish gas. That is tungsten. And the reason why it's so sharp, like a needle, is because it's being sharpened by this. Because, by the way, this is an atomic reaction. How many people know that it has to be an atomic reaction? It is reading the atomic nature of the material and automatically adjusting its temperature to it. It is a form of that. It is a, it is a nuclear reaction. I asked a nuclear physicist, Smith from Brigham Young University, when I paid a lot of money to get Brown to inter introduce him to Smith, I said, if I could do that, what would that be? And he said, well, if you could do that, it would be an atomic reaction. If I could turn tungsten, sublimate it immediately with a flame I could put my hand through, he said, that would have to be an atomic reaction. He said, but I don't know you can do that. I said, well, okay, I know I can do it, so I don't care if you know you can do it or not. Now watch, I put it in here, by the way I can count to 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, bet you guys didn't know I could count to 10. Now I'm going to just drop this in a second here, I'm just going to tell myself when, okay. <clears throat> Obviously not a hot flame, not until that touches it. It automatically changes its temperature to the melting point of the material. Now, by the way, we're going to cut this piece of steel right here. Anybody here cut steel? Anybody cut steel? We're going to cut that piece of steel, and when we cut it, it's room temperature. No preheat at all. How fast is your gas ready to go to work? Now, right now fully ready now and it's going to be room temperature and when we cut it there's not going to be any slag at all now watch my hand is on this my hand is going through this no preheat and when we cut it don't you normally get slobber slag there will be no slag it will come off of there looking just like this it is the most unique cutter in the world. Now that's the same gas going in your automobile. Same gas. The most dynamic gas in the world. See any slobbers?
You don't have to prep it. You don't have to do any post work with it. Now, I'm not trying to sell this as a cutter. Now, I want you guys to see how dynamic this fuel is from the system you're about to learn about. It's dynamic. We use oxygen to blow it through, but we don't need the oxygen for heat to make it hotter. We just need it to direct the flame. Now, you notice I can still put my hand through the flame. There it is, buddy. Can, can you feel the heat in that camera? There it is. You ever see a better cut than that? Right now. How dynamic is water gas? Water gas pretty dynamic? So how hot it is even still? That's your water gas. Why don't I just put this in your pocket right here? We're just... <laughs> Yeah, so water gas is a very, very, very dynamic gas. Now, by the way, people said they will believe me when pigs fly. So you see that pig flying there? <laughs> now, over here, we're going to take the same fuel. See? going to put it right into this engine you guys are going to be putting into a, a vehicle class projects you'll be doing that yourself but now when the fuel comes in one last thing about this fuel the fuel is stoichiometric stoichiometric means it's an ideal mixture it's two hydrogens one oxygen it's a perfect mixture as long as it's stoichiometric it is not explosive, it is implosive. It is the only gas that will not explode, it will implode. So if I had gas coming from this fuel cell, it was filled with gas, gas was coming out of a line over here, and I had a backflash, it would backflash all the way through that line back over to this, it would not explode, it would implode. It would try to suck this into a vacuum. Boom, right now. Try to suck that in. There's so many extrusions in this, all you would hear is just a small little pop. pop like that. That's it. How safe is your gas tank? How safe is this? So see, way safer than anything else you got in the car. Way safer. But as it comes out of here, it comes out of here as a stoichiometric gas if I'm going to put it as an only fuel into this, into this uh, engine, then I'm going to need to make it non-stoichiometric. Why? If I add one oxygen to it, if I add one hydrogen to it, then it's no longer stoichiometric. It's now no longer two to one, and it becomes explosive. So it is the only gas that I can make be implosive, or explosive, depending upon what my desires are. If I mix it in your airline, is it not going to now come into your fuel, uh, into, your, into your engine as a dynamic fuel ready to explode? When it hits your gasoline, it's going to become even more ready to explode. Now, we're going to add air right here. So air is going to come in from the room to show you this. Then we get explosion on the pistons. If we didn't have the air, we would have to design this engine to suck the pistons up because it would be creating vacuums to suck the piston up. We can draw an instantaneous vacuum of any size by filling any vessel with water gas, hitting it with a spark, and we get an immediate vacuum of any size whatsoever. That, by the way, is pretty dynamic. By the way, also, how many people know that we can do everything with water gas you can do with natural gas? So when they say there's a shortage of natural gas, there might be a shortage of natural gas, but if I can do everything with water gas you can do with a natural gas, is there a shortage of water? The earth is two-thirds water. There's no shortage of water. And so every ocean 
Every river, every lake is a deposit of fossil fuels. Wrap your brain around that concept. Amazing concept, isn't it? So you see, if they're trying to control us with the limited amount of fossil fuel and the fact that they own the fossil fuel, do you understand that this right here is a, a, a dynamic thing? Yes, liberation is exactly the right idea. Anyway, so I just wanted to show you that this, uh, this has a lot of potential. Now, we're going to take a starter, like you got a starter on your car, you got to have that too, and we're going to engage the belt, start the engine, then he'll pull the belt off, and it's running on nothing but water gas. Water gas. Imagine the water a farmer is pumping being the fuel to pump the water. Instead of $100,000 worth of gasoline or diesel running a Caterpillar or a Chrysler engine. Now, these are the things that I wanted to introduce to you and show you. Do not be concerned about the fact that we are bringing something and somebody isn't going to like it. Right now, you will find out that we have figured out how to work with the computer system within that car. And somebody would say, are you tampering with the computer in the car? Do you know who is tampering with the computer in the car right now? There's tampering going on. It is illegal tampering. Do you know who is tampering with the computer in cars today? General Motors is tamping, tampering with the computer. The motor manufacturers are tampering with the computer because it's supposed to be set to give you greater fuel economy and it's supposed to be set to give us less pollution. Let me tell you the last thing General Motors ever wants to do, see us in a court of law. That's the last thing they ever want to do because we would be able to prove to a jury of 12 they have been being lied to, defrauded, and deceived by the motor manufacturers to be getting lousy fuel economy right now when all they really had to do was stop cheating and you would have gotten the fuel economy that you deserve. And the environment would have had less pollution in the environment. You think they ever want to see that in the court of law? No. I'm going to introduce you to my caller, a man who I'm in awe of, I can tell you. I am in awe of his wisdom and his knowledge. I hope you guys will see why. I, I, I'm sure you guys will see why. So, uh, Mike, if you'd like to come up here, I'd like to just introduce my caller and then turn this class over to him. This guy's also, yeah. So, that guy's also the top. He's our top uh, head of research for the pre-ignition catalytic converter. We actually borrowed him from the pre-ignition catalytic converter technology to come solve our problems with the hydro-assist fuel cell.